We've got Tribbles on the ship, Quinto Triticale in the corridors, Klingons in the quadrant. It can ruin your whole day, sir. Bridge to World Dex. Wait, trying to dig myself out of a bunch of furry things. Ah, uh, excuse me. Ah, uh, okay. Bridge to World Dex. Welcome aboard Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm Steve Morris. And Scott, I've been thinking a lot about getting a pet. I don't know if I should get a cat or a hamster or maybe a tribble. A tribble? Well, make sure you don't feed him and make sure, you know, it's not one that grows and grows and grows like the ones in More Tribbles, More Troubles, the animated series classic that we are covering here on Enterprise Incidents. And we are so excited to to be joined by a very, very, very special guest. Uh, He is the author of the new book, came out last year, called Phasers on Stun, How the Making and Remaking of Star Trek Changed the World. He is also the author of Luke Skywalker Can't Read and Other Geeky Truths. He has covered Star Trek for Sci-Fi Wire and Star Trek.com. He has also written about other things than Star Trek in Vulture, Vice, and the New York Times. Welcome aboard Enterprise Incidents, Ryan Britt. Thanks for having me. So excited to have you here. So first, I just want to ask you about your book. Just like what made the, this the right time and, and with a fresh new approach to look at the history of Star Trek? Well, I, I, the 40th anniversary of The Wrath of Khan was coming out last year, um, as you know, as you both know. And um, in 2020... I decided that I wanted to pitch a Star Trek book, and I picked that as the um, sort of time that it should come out because I felt like that was a really good example of where Star Trek was radically reinvented, and yet we now think of that reinvention as being classic, right? (laughs) Um, And I think that's really interesting. So I thought that was an interesting phenomenon that you see in pop culture over and over again, where the radical reinvention at certain point becomes the touchstone. And that Star Trek is very unique in, in that way and that it reinvents itself. Um, I had done a lot of reporting on the new shows and um, uh, for the, some of the places you mentioned, but also for Inverse and Den of Geek, uh, where I write now, um, as well as Esquire. And um, I wanted to use some of the reporting I'd done in the new shows and get through everything um, and create a book that, you know, your grandma could pick up at the airport and not be super intimidated by. And just say, hey, if you don't know anything, because there's a lot of people that love Star Trek at this stage. I'll tell you a story. I interviewed uh, Celia Rose Gooding, who plays Uhura on Strange New Worlds. And she told me that her first Uhura um, was Zoe Saldana. And this I found out after I finished my book. But, you know, she's in her 20s. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, And I thought, wow, well, that's exactly... who, you know, the fan like her is who this book is for, who may not know what the cage is, who may not know about uh, how Roddenberry came back at the last minute to do the next generation, who might not know about uh, Nick Meyer and the Wrath of Khan, um, and also may not know, you know, some of the things about the new shows about, you know, Michael Shabone being this Pulitzer Surprise winning novelist who wrote this pitch that convinced Patrick Stewart to come back and do Picard. Um, So yeah, that was the idea just to tell it all and, and be just kind of amazed by it. You know, you know, because it's a truly malleable phenomenon. Yeah, you know, a few years ago, it's funny you're talking about Celia Rose Gooding's uh, uh, as Zoe Saldana was her Uhura. So a few years ago, I was at a restaurant and a waiter comes over. I notice he's wearing he's wearing the Delta Shield pin on his on his vest on his uniform. So I go, oh, you're a Star Trek fan. So am I. I love Star Trek too. I said, I said, which show is your favorite? So he shakes his head. He goes, no, 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 no. I, I just like the movies with Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto. And I went, well, I'll be damned. You know, there is a Star Trek show for everyone, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. But I, I, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of people that are a little younger than me worked for me when I was an, a full-time editor at Inverse. And that was their introduction to Trek as well. Amazing. And, and in between, you know, Into Darkness, Beyond, and where we are now, you know, that was kind of where their fandom existed. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting, it, there's a lot of different types of fans. Um, you, yeah. <laughs> you know, what'd be interesting, I think, is if you could go to each generation of these fans and when they came into Star Trek and say, give me a two sentence description of the essence of Star Trek. And I bet it would be really interesting to see what the evolution 
of that description was over time. Because someone who falls in love with the, you know, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek world is, which I like a lot, is different from someone who fell in love with Next Gen or someone who fell in love with Deep Space Nine. They're, they're all kind of, they're, they're the same universe-ish, but yeah. they're different <laughs> expressions of those same Star Trek ideas. And I'm, I'm just experiencing this with my daughter now because she, we started her with The Trouble with Tribbles. That was her first Star Trek she ever saw. And then we shifted into the animated series. So the first animated series episode she ever saw was the one we're going to talk about today. Oh, um, cool. So I'm experiencing this and now I'm showing her next gen, but I'm curating it very heavily, you know, for sure. like, she's only five, you know, but I'm seeing what's appropriate. And it's interesting um, to see how she responds to it um, and how it's similar and how it's different from my response. as a Well, well, that's a really good say into what we're t- what we're covering on this episode of Enterprise Incidents, which is more tribbles, more troubles. So, so Ryan, I want to ask, like, what is it about the animated series? It's it's overlooked, you know, it's it's underrated, but yet here you have a series that premiered seven years to the day after the original series, and you have all the the voice uh, actors returns, except for obviously Walter Koenig. And then you have story editor, Dorothy Fontana, executive producer, Gene Roddenberry. You know, you have so many writers, including the writer for this episode from the original series who are returning. So why doesn't the animated series get the respect that it absolutely deserves? You know, I don't know. Um, And I think that it may just be because there's this perception. I talked to Howard Weinstein, uh, who wrote, you know, The Pirates of Orion um, in, in, for the animated series. I talked to him at length for my book, and he said, you know, there was this myth that Star Trek was dead in the 70s, but it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's when it was in syndication. That's when a lot of people were first finding out about it. That's when the conventions happened. That's when the animated series happened from 73 to 74. And then, you know, there's a few years, and then you've got the motion picture. Um I think it may just be because and you guys mentioned this in some of your previous episodes that there is some repetition in some of the episodes um, that they kind of uh, will fall back on a familiar thing that they can do within the budget that they have. And I think that some of that repetition con- combined with the production values that are are perhaps um, don't remind people enough of the original series is why. Um, but and I say this in my book, and I and, and I and I say this especially now that I've rewatched a lot of the animated series with my my five year old daughter is that I would put up some of the basic ideas of the animated series against many other episodes of many other iterations of Trek. I mean, the joke I was making is that one of our planets, uh, one of our planets is missing. Another favorite of my of my daughter's. Um, that's basically the plot of Discovery season four. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's the same plot. You know, um, you know, and I would argue managed in this really interesting, quick way. Um, And the other thing the animated series has going for it, which is great for kids, is that it's not as violent. There's not as much violence and sex as there is in the original series. So if you're letting a little kid watch it, you can kind of just be like, all right, this is going to be fine. You know, and it's but it's still Star Trek. You know what I mean? It's still Star Trek. And um, it really is a bridge, I think, between the original series and the next generation in that way. And that it's a little bit more family friendly. You know, you know, you you, you talk about uh, one of our planets is missing. I mean, you know, first of all, it was great to have Alan Dean Foster as a guest on that episode. But, you know, when Steve and I were talking about that, we're we're just going like, this is a really good Star Trek episode. It's half the length. It's animated. But so many of the themes and the qualities that we love about Star Trek, this burden of command about like, you know, what is Kirk going to do? And, you know, about saving 82 million, million people. And then you know, you're, you're bringing back, uh, you know, the Commodore from the ultimate computer. He's the governor of the planet. Bob Wesley. Bob Wesley. Yeah. So you're, you're, you really are uh, looking at the animated series as the season four that we never got. And I think that, that, that I guess quality uh, wise, it's no, I would certainly say it's no worse <laughs> than season three and it, maybe be even better. a little better. <laughs> yeah. Be yeah. Better, yeah. I, I, I've been trying to think of a good way to say this. And I think part of it is for, first of all, the production value things that are bad in the animated series, they're, they're bad, you know, like the, you know, using the same (laughs) still over and over again, using the same music over and over again, the total lack of animation of the characters a lot of the time. 
I mean, that's just not, you know, that's just not good TV. And so if, the, if, if you're watching for that, if you turned it on and watched three minutes of it, you're just like, well, this is bad. Like, and so, so I, I think that's a real thing. The other thing that I think is that in terms of story, at least so far, in terms of story, nothing has been remotely as bad as the bad episodes of the original series, which are <laughs> of which are really genuinely this doesn't make sense. This doesn't work. All of the stories we watched so far have made sense. They've existed within the Star Trek world, and the characters are all still the characters in the way that we saw characters behaving in ways that weren't in character. Like, for instance, in the Mark of Gideon, where Kirk is just not even seeming to care about what happened to his crew. Exactly. That, that is just that that was wrong and bad in the way that the animated series hasn't been. But I also think because of the length and because of the lack of emotional depth, because we haven't really had a lot of emotional depth with the depth with the possible exception of yesteryear so far yes is that because of that it's all in sort of like a lower key you know it's all compressed it's all it's very good star trek ideas the characters are there it's well written but the production is values are weak and the emotional content is much much lessened that's kind of how i'd put it up to this point yeah, but I think that there's something – I say this too. In, in my book, I said this too. In uh, Chapter 5, I cover the anime <laughs> series, um, a total, oh, an almost totally new enterprise is the title of that chapter. Um, is um, <laughs> I say that the batting – I say what you're saying, Steve, is the batting average is more consistent yeah. in the animated series overall than season three of the original series. And that's 100% true. The other thing I like about the animated series is, again, if you think about it as a it was a show that was on Saturday morning for kids, right? So then you say, was it a good introduction to Star Trek for kids? And I think it is because, and this is a great example of uh, one, one of our planets is missing is a great example of this. And the episode we're about to talk about is that the monster or alien threat isn't evil, you know, and that right. is so uncommon in, uh, in particularly kids adventure stories of that time. But even now, you know, that there, there are not very many like, yes, my daughter is very aware that the Klingons and the Romulans are up to no good uh, in the original series, but um, <laughs> you know, and, and in the animated series, but there's something about the redeemable nature of the conflicts. You know, everybody's kind of, it's a misunderstanding half the time. And I think that's a really great, uh, introduction to young people who are getting into Star Trek. Well, and that's a really good up. point. That's a really good point, Ryan, because when you look at some of the best episodes of the original series, especially the ones written by Gene Kuhn, you know, you have what you think is a monster and then it's just misunderstood. It's not a monster. Of course, I'm talking about the Horta well, in the dark, yeah. and uh, the companion from Metamorphosis. Both of those episodes were written by Kuhn, um, who is obviously an amazing writer. But you know, when we were going through season three of the original series in, and we went in production order, not in the air date order, what we discovered on Enterprise Incidents, me and Steve, was that season three gets a bad rap. For the first half of season three, it's actually really good. It's after Plato's stepchildren where the quality starts to suffer and you have more not so good ones than good ones. But then you still have episodes like All Our Yesterdays and Let favorites. That Be Your Last Battlefield, which is really good. Um, at least we think so. But now that we're looking at the animated series, you know, I, I was really, really surprised because I did not have that deep dive knowledge of the animated series like I did with the original. You know, I just watched it's been a long time since I've seen these, but rewatching this now and, and having a, a, a really good eye and really scrutinizing these episodes, I'm surprised by how well they really do hold up as just episodes of Star Trek, including more tribbles, more troubles. So, mm -hmm. so I want to ask you, Ryan, like, what do you love about more tribbles, more troubles? What does your daughter love about it? And how do you think it holds up as a sequel to the trouble with tribbles? Well, I think it's really funny. Um, and I think that if David Gerald hadn't come back to write it, that could have not happened. Yeah. Um, it's clearly written by the same person. I like that it actually is Sereno Jones, that it is Stanley Adams that returns as the triple keeper, Sereno Jones. And I, I think the one liners in it are amazing. Yeah. And we can get to them as we talk about the episode, but I think that they're just absolutely hilarious. And I think that it's also a, one of these good examples of like, a, a classic sequel where it's kind of the same problem, but remixed. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> I, knew, you know? I, was, I knew Steve was going to have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> Quinto, Quinto Triticale, you know, like, um, but I, I appreciate that as a writer um, because I like the idea that that's kind of how you had to do sequels at a certain point. You had to kind of be like, okay, well, what worked? How can we do <laughs> yeah. that again? Um, but I think there are some really, really funny uh, lines in it. And I think that's what I love about The Trouble with Tribbles. And I always find something new that's funny about the trouble with tribbles and that's what i like about more tribbles more troubles is there is a funny line of dialogue almost every couple minutes um and it's really great uh, steve what about you like like when you were doing your rewatch for for this like what what did you think so I, i've had the, literally the exact same reaction to every episode we've watched in the animated series which i'm like this is Star Trek. It's pretty good. I mean, this feels, I could feel that this is like the trouble with Tribbles. It's very much there. I'll tell you the one thing that makes me sad is that they are very much trying to reproduce. And I think successfully what was good about the trouble with Tribbles. And, and it's, it, and, and I'll say one other thing too, which is that this idea, which is a term that didn't exist in 1973, but we talk a lot, a lot today is fan service is mm. the idea that there's the special people with the real inside knowledge who read the comic book or played the Last of Us video game or did that thing, and we want to make sure that they feel included and that their special knowledge is reflected. And I think in the first several episodes we've done of the animated series, almost every episode has done something that referenced the original series in ways that people who were real fans would go, oh my God, there's Sarek. Oh my God, there's this character. Oh, you know, that that's what's happening. And I think that is really, uh, really neat in at this level up to a certain point. <laughs> and, I, and I'm wondering as we go, when I'm going to hit that point where I go, okay, I need some more originality. The other thing I think about, about Tribbles is the one thing that they don't try to reproduce or recreate is for me the thing, the heart, the greatest moment in the episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, and that is Scotty and the fight and getting in trouble. That's like, that's what makes that episode great. It's actually not the Tribbles for me personally. And that's uh, not something well, that they didn't, that they tried to recreate. Can I tell you a quick story is that that fight is great in The Trouble with Tribbles. Um, my daughter still thinks that that character's name, and I think his name is Korax, the Klingon who antagonizes mm -hmm. Scotty, right. mm -hmm. who reappears in this episode, um, also voiced by James yeah. Duan. Um, yes. <laughs> but um, my daughter is convinced that that character's name is Laddie because uh, of the sure. line, right. Laddie, don't you think you should rephrase that? And um, I I, I tweeted this, and John Van Sitters of, of CBS uh, Star Trek publicity said we can make that canon if you want. Um, <laughs> we can change that Klingon's name. But I think that that's a really good point, Steve. I hadn't thought of that because they don't actually meet the Klingons physically, right? Because they're all on the different ships. So it's kind of like one of these ship fight episodes that we get in the movies later. You know, where the where right. Kirk and Koloth don't meet. You know. Um, it's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. You, you know, when I was watching uh, More Troubles, More Troubles, and again, it's been seriously, uh, I, I, I'm not even exaggerating when I say it's been decades since I've seen this episode. I, I really was surprised by, you know, just like watching One of Our Planets is Missing yesteryear uh, and Lorelei Signal, you know, wow, this really is good. And what I immediately appreciated about More Troubles, More Troubles is that just like the trouble with Tribbles, there is a point in the episode where it goes from being vintage Star Trek with suspense and, and action in the case of the attacking Klingon to a shift in tone, a, dr a dramatic and abrupt shift in tone that works and it turns into the comedy just like the trouble with Tribbles turned into a comedy this episode turned into a comedy. There are great lot one-liners. There's great back and forth between Spock and McCoy and Kirk and Spock. Uh, and I think all of it works just as well in animated form as it did in live action. It feels like, you know, Gene Kuhn, Dorothy Fontana, David Gerald era Star Trek. Uh, and it's an episode that only 24 minutes. That's including the beginning and ending credits. It has it all. It is action, excitement, suspense, and humor. You close your eyes while you have the sound on to more tribbles, more troubles, and you'd swear you were watching an episode of the original series. Even with the music being what it is, you know, repetitive. I know that that Steve doesn't love that part of it, but hey, what are you gonna do? Um, I agree. <laughs> but you know, but some of the some of the plot points are recycled from the from its predecessor. 
but I still think it works. And I think it's a lot of fun. And I think just like this far in, you know, the fifth episode that aired uh, and it aired on October 6th, 1973, making it the 84th episode of Star Trek to air. But no surprise, gentlemen, that More Troubles, More Troubles had a production number of 22001, which made it the first episode of the animated series to go into production. It was also one of three episodes that the entire cast have recorded on the same day, in addition to Yesteryear and uh, Beyond the Farthest Star. Uh, writer David Gerald returned for this. Of course, he also uh, wrote this, the animated series episode, Bam. He submitted his final draft on April 23rd, 1973. And as I'm sure you guys know, I mean, David Gerald told us the story. It's uh, been written about uh, in, in so many books that this episode was intended to be a sequel episode for season three of the original series. However, Fred Freiberger, the producer and showrunner for season three, did not like The Trouble with Tribbles. He didn't like humor in Star Trek. He did not think that Star Trek was a comedy and Star Trek should not be funny. Clearly, he did not have the greatest sense of humor. So it got jettisoned, and uh, David Jarrell was definitely, understandably disappointed, but... Uh, David Gerald was called by Dorothy Fontana in 1973 when the animated series was in development. And David Gerald said, I was one of the first writers that Dorothy Fontana called. When she came aboard the animated series as associate producer, she said to me, do you want to do more Tribbles, more Troubles? Of course, we're going to do the Tribble episode that we didn't get to do during Star Trek's third season. Gerald's original concept called for the Tribbles to be vicious predators that would eat the crew members and they would go missing. But once the production staff realized that now that we're doing an animated series for Saturday morning and the kids are going to be watching, yeah, we we can't do that. (laughs) Would you like to know some of the things going on in the world in the week leading up to the release of this episode? Can't wait to hear Well, maybe you'll rethink that because what we've been building to is some pretty serious stuff happening. Um, The first is that on October 4th, the United Nations banned South Africa's foreign minister from addressing the UN because of apartheid. And then the president of the General Assembly overruled that banning and said no UN member can be denied, denied the right to speak. And so the South African foreign minister gets to the United Nations in New York. He rises to speak, and just before he can begin speaking, every representative from every other African country stands up and walks out, which I think is a pretty dramatic thing to happen back in 1970. It sure is. On October 5th, Elton John releases the double album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, obviously. Huge album. Great album. One of my favorite albums of all time. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, Well, I'm glad that you're enjoying that album because what happens on October 6th is very serious because this is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. This is the buildup to the Yom Kippur War. And at 2.05 p.m. in the afternoon, Egypt and Syria launched simultaneous attacks on Israel. And this is the fourth and, of course, by far the largest Arab-Israeli conflict. And we will hear more about what happened when we come back next week (laughs) for our next (laughs) episode of the animated series. Uh, shall we get into more tribbles, more troubles? Let's dive in literally and figuratively. (laughs) Uh, so we start in act one with a log and right away, if you were a fan of the troubles with tribbles, you immediately hear things that sound familiar because the enterprise has been assigned to escort two robot grain ships to Sherman's planet, which has been struck by crop failures and famine. This shipment of seed grain, Quinto Triticale, is necessary to the survival of the colonists. All right, all right, I got I got something to say about it. So, so the Quinto Triticale was supposed to be uh, much easier to to develop than Quadro Triticale, but it's like, how do we make this one better? You know, we're going to make this grain. This is going to go to eleven. So yep. instead of Quadro Triticale, we're going to call it Quinto Triticale. The star date when uh, Captain Kirk is doing his uh, star date, it's fifty three ninety two point four. Which, if you go by star date order in the adventures of the original series, that puts the adventure of More Tribbles, More Troubles, right smack in between the Empath and the Mark of Gideon. 
just mm. like a few of these last animated episodes we dived mm. into on Enterprise Incidents. And we are breaking away from these robot ships to pursue a Klingon battle cruiser. And we've also heard that the Klingons might have a new weapon. And there is we see the Klingon ship and it is closing in on this target, which is a small scout ship. And I got to say, this is even though the animation is extremely simple and there's not a lot of action to it, you really do see the advantage the animation had over the original series and the model work, because in terms of the angles and the dynamics of the images, it's pretty cool. Ryan, what do you think uh, about the about the animation? I, I think it gets a bad rap, but at the same time, I still think it looks cool, even after 50 years. I think the spaceship stuff is great. I loved it as a kid um, when I watched the animated series. I love watching it now. I actually love all the like extra ships that we get in the animated series. I like uh, Sereno Jones's little shuttle here. We don't know it's Sereno Jones yet at this point in the episode. Um, and yeah, like, again, watching it through a kid's eyes with my daughter is like, this was her first big, like, Star Trek space battle. And I actually kind of like how it is. <laughs> it's like a platonic ideal of Star Trek space battles, right? Because <laughs> it's like sort of drawn out. There's something else going on. And then there's something that they don't understand, which is this Klingon weapon, right? But that also they have to be tricky, like Kirk and Spock have to be tricky uh, with their uh, tactics. Um, in more than one way. So I, I actually love the way all the ships look in the animated series. I like all the space stuff. I don't think that I have zero complaints about it. Yeah, you know the 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 design of the uh, cargo ship carrying the grain. You know, I'm looking at this design. I'm going, God, that looks really familiar. And it's not just because I hadn't seen the episode in a while. And then I realized, wait a minute, the cargo ship is the same type of ship that we saw as the Antares. At the beginning oh, yeah. of the mm. remastered version of Charlie X, it's the same class. So, because you know, in the original version of Charlie X, we didn't see the Antares; we just heard about it. But you know, when Mike Akuda, Denise Akuda, and Dave Rossi went back, and they're like, mm, "Let's have some fun with Charlie X here by by having, you know, let's let's see what the Antares looks like," and it looks just like these cargo ships, which is which is actually referred to on Memory Alpha as an Antares class cargo ship. And I, I did notice that when Captain Kirk was doing his his log, he called it uh Quinto Triticale. <laughs> and it's been a few years since Kirk had to say the words uh or Shatner had to say the words quadro triticale. So the uh, the enunciation is a little off, but we can forgive Shatner for that. Well, that's the sabotage, sabotage, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, that, exactly. There's a triple in my chicken sandwich and coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's a bunch of things going on at once. One is we're trying to raise the Klingon ship who is not re uh, responding, and we ask them to stop firing. They are firing on this scout ship. We're trying to beam someone off of the scout ship. We've got our phasers on, we got our deflectors up, we're heading in at warp eight, and they finally hit that scout ship. They got him. Scotty, have you got that pilot yet? I don't know, sir. That blast decalibrated the integration parameters. That you have this small scout ship being attacked by the Klingons. And Scotty's in the transporter room trying to, to get the lone pilot off before it explodes. Kind of made me feel a little bit like the beginning, the first act of Mud's Women, when Scotty was trying to beam mud in his cargo this is me cargo uh off before the ship exploded um and also i i should have brought this up when we were talking i think about uh beyond the farthest star steve but there's an angle on the bridge when you're looking at the view screen and looking at sulu and off to the left you see a turbo lift door so this is where in the animated series they introduce the notion that there's more than one door to the bridge of the Enterprise. Oh, yeah. There is a second turbo lift door, which we saw in Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and then we later saw in the Next Generation. But, but you know, the next the, the animated series, you know, in a lot of ways was a a, a bridge between the old show and and what we were going to see in the Motion Picture. I love how much time this takes up, actually, because in my memory, when I when I hadn't rewatched. More Troubles, More Troubles in a while. You forget how much of the episode is front-loaded with this uh, sort of um, problem with the Klingons before Sereno Jones even materializes. And I think it's really interesting because structurally it does sort of like, like you said, Scott, like it's sort of, there's a tonal shift that comes. Yep. But you don't, if, if you don't know, you don't, and you've never seen it before, it's actually kind of amazing 
when he does materialize. And I actually kind of like the suspense of how long it takes for Scotty, because they do that in TNG, too, where it kind of takes a while sometimes to reassemble somebody's pattern. It feels very Chief O'Brien to me um, (laughs) in, in, in um, in this scene. And then the Klingon battlecruiser turns and comes right at them and fires their new weapon at the Enterprise. And immediately, the engines die, their phasers won't work, their photon torpedoes won't work. The stasis field disables all higher order field and warp functions. And I love Uhura's line. We could always throw rocks. (laughs) So this is the first time we're seeing a Klingon ship on the animated series. And uh, Koloth's ship, and we don't know what's Captain Koloth yet, uh, is referred to in the teleplay, not mentioned in the episode, as the IKS Divisor. It's in the script, not in the episode, but in the Deep Space Nine episode, Trials and Tribulations, the Klingon ship is called the IKS Garoth. Now, I'm trying to think, what does IKS stand for? So I'm thinking Imperial Klingon Starship. I yeah, like I think it. that that's yeah. it. I think that's I think that's correct. That yeah, sounds that right. Sounds that's good. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. And now we get hailed by the Klingon ship, and there is although I don't think they say his name right away, but it is Captain Koloth. And you know, Captain Koloth in the Trouble with Tribbles was played by the great William Campbell. Now I prefer William Campbell's performance in in one of my favorite episodes of the original series is the Squire of Gothos. I mean, he yeah. just is fantastic in the Squire of Gothos. I could go off on that episode, but or you could just go back and listen to our deep dive on that because that was that was a long one. <laughs> we had a lot to say about it. So I just think that one of the flaws of More Troubles, More Troubles is that they were not able to get William Campbell back to do that voice because who does it sound like, Steve Morris? Jimmy doing, but I actually think he is doing a, <laughs> he's doing a, his best job at imitating William Campbell, you yeah, know? Yeah, true. <laughs> like, this is not the most, if I hadn't listened to his voice on 27 other characters in four <laughs> episodes, I, I, that number might not even be that much exaggerated. It wouldn't bug me as much in this particular one, but I agree with you. It would have been, you got Cyrano yeah. Jones. To yeah. get William Campbell would have been. I mean, I think that it's good that they had at least Stanley Adams to do Cyrano Jones. If they hadn't had either of them, I think you could have potentially had a big difference in this episode. Sure. Particularly from, a again, a child's perspective. Like, they may not remember Captain Koloth as much, but they will definitely remember Sereno Jones because of the physical comedy. I think that's the only thing I'll say about losing William Campbell in this. And I agree with you that he's better in the Squire of Gothos than he is in the Triple episode. But um, the physical comedy of just the way they move in those rooms in the original series episode is really great. Um, And Campbell has a way he's just so different from all the other Klingons, really, in the whole canon, right? Yeah. Just, like the way <laughs> yeah. just the way he stands and the way he moves and then and the way he smiles and the, my dear Captain Kirk. And so, I don't know. I, <laughs> But maybe you needed to have him be a little bit more generic in this, I, I guess. It doesn't bug me. I have to say, it it, it, it would have bugged me had Sereno Jones also been James Doohan. <laughs> I think that would have been a problem. I think in terms of consistency, the, the, the Klingons throughout the course of the original series – we're, we're all over the place. You know, you had the sinister Klingon played by John Colicos as core, the first actor to play a Klingon. But, you know, then, you know, you had the Klingon from Friday's Child who was kind of a wimp. And then, you know, Koloth is is more, more playful than you would think a Klingon should be. It isn't until Kang in season three's Day of the Dove that I really felt like, all right, now there's a badass Klingon. And I think I think Michael and Sarah's performance as core uh, as Kang. Kang uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think that is what uh, inspired and informed like Ron Moore. Ron Moore's Klingons and Moore writing Klingons. about yeah. the Klingons yeah. in Next Generation and and yeah. so on. I agree. Yeah, Kang feels like he's a real Klingon from the rest of the canon <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> for the Next Generation. But yeah, release my ship. I'd be delighted to, Captain Kirk. If you will turn over the pilot of the little ship. That ship was a Federation-built craft. The pilot is under our protection. He has committed ecological sabotage. Ecological sabotage. Sabotage? Sabotage. (laughs) (laughs) If I have to take him by force, I will. And then Kirk, with classic bluster, says, The first Klingon to step aboard this ship will be the last Klingon. That's our captain. (laughs) And while this conversation is happening, Uhura goes quietly to Spock, 
to tell him... I'm losing contact with our robot ships. They're not held by the stasis field and they're moving out of range. I gotta say, I like all of this. Like this we're getting into... Kirk coming up with a cool strategy of how he's going to get us out of this situation. When he he overhears this, he ends the call with Koloth. Bring them back, Mr. Sulu. Have them ram the Klingon ship. Yeah, ram the Klingon ship. Can't afford to lose that grain. Yeah. We can't afford to lose the Enterprise. We can afford to lose the Enterprise even less, right? Yeah, true. (laughs) (laughs) And we bring in the two robot ships. And I, I just, this is sort of this thing I've been talking about a bunch lately of when we don't need to understand a bunch of technological gobbledygook to understand what Kirk's doing. He's bringing in the two ships at two different angles so the Klingon ship will have more to deal with than they can handle. And this all makes perfect sense. In yep, what he's, sure does. His yeah, it doesn't get bogged down by some of the techno, the techno babble that, uh, you know, was sort of a pet peeve of mine going into like the later shows. Yeah. And one of the, the, the Klingons fire on one of the grain ships, but it looks like they don't have a lot of power. And we hear... They couldn't maintain the stasis field. Keep your phasers locked on target, Mr. Sulu. Hold your fire until they fire first. Aye, sir. Scotty is still trying to get the uh, pilot beamed over. Finally, he materializes. We know that man. It appears to be. I don't want to think about it. Cyrano Jones. So, yes, of course, uh, Cyrano Jones, once again, voiced by Stanley Adams, played, you know, Cyrano Jones in The Trouble with Tribbles. And this is the point where more tribbles, more troubles kind of shifts in tone to being more of a comedy. You start to get more playful dialogue with the, with the characters, uh, more more funny one-liners. Scotty's voice, it goes, And he's got tribbles with him. Tribbles! Tribbles! <laughs> Did you say, that, Scott, that this is one of the episodes where they actually all were there recording together? Yes, that's right totally shows particularly in Shatner's performance. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I I I I remember reading that that they did, you know, later they didn't do that. And I think that when you do get into some of those season 2 episodes, it does feel a little like they you know, just Shatner write the stopped. dialogues. Yeah. Shatner stopped in a motel and recorded it and was like, I'm done. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, you know. but, you know, for these first few episodes, I, I think the strength, uh, part of the strength is that it, it, they, they were all together when they were recording these. Now, now David Gerald said, once we brought Cyrano on board, then things got fun because then I could start having fun writing those funny lines. I love writing funny lines. And Spock and Cyrano Jones, side by side, you get all kinds of opportunities to do funny lines. But if you notice, what color, gentlemen, are the Tribbles? Pink. This is what I wanted to ask you, Scott. Why are the Tribbles pink? Uh, the Tribbles are pink because all the Tribbles were pink because director Hal Sutherland was colorblind. Now, I have read that though he was colorblind, that there was another animator that also liked the color pink and that there is some conflict about this explanation. Okay. Well, according to David Gerald, he said, when, okay. the, when the cells came back and we saw that the tribbles were pink, we went, what happened? That's where we found out that the guy who did the colors for filmation is colorblind. So we told him, no, the tribbles are brown, but it was too late. He had already assigned the colors. And there you go. <laughs> well, just, yeah, well, I love it. Was, it. Yeah. <laughs> Not, I don't, but I'm glad <laughs> that you do. <laughs> but again, think about it in terms of a kid's show. Think about it. You have a kid who's never seen Star Trek, and this is where the tribbles get even funnier. And having them be pink, I think, is great. We have five pink tribbles in my house um, that we bought from David Gerald's Tribble Company. You know what I mean? Like, wow, uh, wow. <laughs> you know, we buy the tribbles. I buy the tribbles from the tribble website. Um, we should get them to sponsor your podcast. Um, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I think that it's great. And I, my, one of my only complaints about the, uh, um, cameos from tribbles in the newer shows, there's tribbles in discovery, um, uh, more than once, uh, there's, there's uh, Star Trek three, Star Trek three, they're yep. white. Yeah, the white uh-huh, one in there, right. and then um, there's a triple in uh, Star, Star Trek. Trek I, won't, I, I won't say where the triple appears. Uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. There's a triple that plays a huge part of the plot. Um, <laughs> there's a triple in Star Trek Picard that I won't mention that may honor one of David Gerald's original ideas, actually. Um, but yeah, we haven't had any pink trouble triples in um, the new 
shows, and I, I wish that it would. Just mostly for my kid. But I also thought the Pink Tribbles, as a kid, I didn't mind. I was like, great, it's a cartoon, they're pink. Yeah, Fine. exactly, yeah. You know? It, it, it's for me, it's not that they're pink, it's that it's it's all part of the cheap animation. It's that they're they're the simplest drawings. They're all exactly the same color. There's, you know, it's so uniform. It's just cheap, is I think more my objection than that it's pink. Although I'm not the biggest fan of the pink either. <laughs> but that's the end of Act One. We come back in Act Two, and I like Kirk's log. He says, Our rescue effort has given us some knowledge of the new Klingon weapon and the presence of Cyrano Jones intergalactic traitor and general nuisance. Yeah, I, I love that, you know, Shatner's comic timing is, you know, also just a testament to his talent as an actor, you know, that you can have this like really intense, serious captain and then just like, you know, flip on a dime and do like Mud's women, you know, I Mud rather and Trouble with Tribbles and a piece of the action, the especially. Action, my favorite um, of all time. But if you notice... Uh, that at eight minutes and 24 seconds into the episode, if you, you know, just like pause it at 824, you'll see a transporter ensign who looks just like David Gerald. Oh, <laughs> I always wondered about that. Character. That was deliberate. Right. Oh, cool. Uh, that's it. He's the transporter ensign. David Gerald said there was a line in the script that the transporter crewman looked suspiciously like the author of the episode. Sure enough, when Filmation drew that scene, the animators had some fun and drew a little caricature of me at the transporter console. So I was the transporter crewman. No dialogue, just a sight gag. And this is, I guess, the first of what you would call an Easter egg. Sure, totally. Yep. Um, and the real advantage, by the way, of having not just the, the original writer, but the original actor playing the part is that you can write for him things that that character says and having captain kirk friend kirk <laughs> that's if you didn't have stanley adams come back and you had james Doohan doing this role this wouldn't work Absolutely. but it does totally work and immediately we're talking about sealing out the area and we hear again what we came from the original episode you know the law about transporting animals proven harmful captain these are safe tribbles we talk about the fact that there's no such thing as a safe tribble because of how they reproduce. And Cyrano Jones informs us that's why these tribbles are safe. They don't reproduce. I've had them genetically engineered for compatibility with humanoid ecologies. <laughs> that's very good, Steve. Thank you. That's actually, that's actually fantastic. We should, we should create a Cyrano Jones podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so very, new, new, new adventures of Cyrano Jones. It's a loyal but very small <laughs> audience, I think. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, and, and, I, and what I don't understand, by the way, is why are they so profitable if they don't reproduce? Because how are you going to keep your stock going? Right. Good this point. Is, Maybe that's uh, why these are more expensive triples. I don't think Cyrano Jones is as good a businessman as he thinks he is. That's what Clearly he's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I always, I also have like headcanon that he got off K7. Like his excuse for how he got off Space Station K7 feels – a, like a lie it has and to be so, a lie so i'm like i'm like he's not even thinking about profitability he's just trying to do anything he can that worked before <laughs> you well, know but but i, I want to so, so his what his explanation is is that he found this triple predator, predator that's called a glomer which so first of all let's talk about this moment so he pulls out this little creature he puts it on the ground and we see it walk over start to stand over a triple and then we cut away and so we don't actually watch it, and but the implication is that thing just ate a triple, right? At least it's neat. Yeah, that's the line. That's the that's line the, from McCoy. <laughs> at least it's neat. My daughter says it constantly because we have a glomer. We bought the glomer. Wow. David Gerald's website. We have a glomer. There is a glomer toy in Star Trek Picard season one in the episode Nepente in Kestra Troy Riker's room. Wow. There's a glomer toy. And it's, I believe, the same glomer toy that David Gerald sells. But we have a glomer in my house. Um, I got it for my daughter's fifth birthday. It was one of the last presents she got that day. But yeah, we, uh, we, use, it's great. It, you can put a little pink. It eats a triple. You can put a little pink triple in it. Wow. All right. Uh, here's what I have to say about this. Okay. It ate a triple, and we yep. don't see the glomer eat a triple, but we just hear about it. So first of all, I'm thinking that's kind of vicious. It ate yep. a triple. And then I'm thinking, if that's how Cyrano Jones got off of K7 because of the glomer, then 
that's a lot of triples that the glomer had to eat. And then I'm thinking, like, that sounds awfully violent. <laughs> There's all sorts of things that are totally bizarre about this whole thing. Just <laughs> let's start with this, is that having killing a triple is I mean, there's a thing in movies where you could literally have a movie where you kill 50,000 people, but you can't kill a dog. In fact, I remember this in the movie Independence Day. There's a moment where, you know, a a whole civilization is being destroyed, but the dog is safe. So we're cool. Yeah. So on Saturday Morning Cartoon, the choice to kill the cutest character, cutest creature in all of Star Trek. And just go, oh, at least it's neat. That is really weird. <laughs> and, but, and wait, and then the glomer makes a motion. It makes a motion that I'm going like, did the glomer just belch? Yeah. <laughs> I I, I, lo- I love that they did that, though, because I love that, you know, again, just thinking about it being a kid's show, a kid's introduction is that you've got violence and you've also got like, you know, the whole message of the Tribbles is that they were taken. They keep getting taken out of their correct environment. Right. And they keep sort of like there's, you know, there are animals that shouldn't be in whatever environment they're in and that we we keep messing with their environment and they keep getting, you know, multiplying or turning into, you know, colony creatures or whatever. So I don't know. I kind of love that they went for it, you know, and, and I think they got away with it because we don't see it. If we'd yeah. seen it, eat it, it would have been like, oh, that might yeah, be. very true. Very you true. Know, like, <laughs> so, so the other thing about this, and I actually think this is not a Cyrano Jones line. This is just, it's really just probably a hole in the writing, which is that, Spoiler alert, the glomer came from the Klingons. It was stolen from the Klingon planet. So it's not possible that Cyrano Jones used the glomer to clean up K7 and then left because he didn't have the glomer yet because he was on K7. So, oh, so, so I think this unless is really he's li- Unless he's lying. And Which is were, possible. When there were more Klingons visiting K7 and he did get the glomer from them and then he lied later because i didn't know it was a klingon planet <laughs> i will note that i like that he pulls it out of his pocket because i like that that references his deep pockets from the trouble with tribbles yes absolutely. my favorite part of the trouble with tribbles end is when he has the last glass of wine or whatever in his yeah. pocket that he casually pulls out and the bartender comes back in and takes it oh yeah, the so. back too. yeah. <laughs> that's well, that and it's funny because that's all the stuff that i feel is actually missing from this episode that's the my favorite stuff in the episode too the physical stuff yeah all that physical stuff yeah yeah. Well, the little charactery things that we see as we go around that space station. Um, so, and then we talk about uh, that the Klingons have notoriously bad tempers, and they ask him about the ecological sabotage, and he says, "Me a saboteur, ridiculous." <laughs> Again, um, nicely done. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> I only sold them some tribbles. You sold tribbles on a Klingon planet. And basically, Cyrano Jones, I think, comes as close as you possibly could to actually thanking Kirk for saving his life. Doesn't quite thank him, but comes close. Uh, and, and, but Kirk is like, you know, Jones, you're in violation of three Federation mandates and 47 local ones. <laughs> <laughs> and so we confine him to quarters and uh, McCoy is examining the tribbles and we are, end up in the briefing room where he, McCoy confirms that, yes, they can't reproduce. They just get fat. You know what I was uh, thinking when I was watching of all of all the episodes, you know, an animated episode like what if. In the trouble with Tribbles, instead of being Cyrano Jones, what if it was like Harry Mudd? Harry Mudd, I've thought you about know, that often. Yeah. because Harry Mudd and and Cyrano Jones are kind of cut from the same cloth a little yeah. bit. You know, they're always like getting themselves out of a jam at the last uh, nick of time, sort of thing. And uh, they are definitely nuisances to Captain Kirk. Uh, you know, I would love to have seen the live action look on Kirk's face when he saw Cyrano Jones beam aboard the transporter platform like can you just imagine shatner just doing that like double take that would have been great is is uh roger carmel in uh mud's passion in the end yes series? he is mm-hmm. yeah and it's roger c carmel so it wasn't so it wasn't that they couldn't get him right um that's interesting i mean obviously you could have easily had harry mud take over the tribbles in the animated series and nobody would have batted, batted an eye Sure. Now Harry Mudd sells Tribbles too. You, <laughs> yeah, could, you could have done that, and then and then we could have had Rain Wilson uh, bring Tribbles back in the contemporary go. shows, <laughs> which is great. I love Rain. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I love that idea. I don't know. Maybe if you know what, if the if the if the JJ verse had continued, you would have had a, a Harry Mudd that would have been in charge of all of that. I bet. Maybe it will. 
And then after we talk about the triples, we talk about uh, this Klingon weapon and the balance. What I like is they're, they're discussing the balance between how powerful it is and how much energy it probably uses. They will probably attack us again as soon as they are back up to power. And they will probably begin by destroying the other robot ship to prevent us from repeating the same trick. It's a totally Star Trek-y briefing room scene, I think. Well, well the, another example of just how the tone uh, of, of this episode right now is a little more comedic, but still the stakes are very, very high, is you know Spock is explaining about the stasis weapon that it immobilizes the Enterprise, but also mobilizes the attacking vessel at the same time. And then Scotty goes, Then it's a weapon that leaves them as helpless as it does us? I believe I just said that, Mr. Scott. <laughs> it's it's funny because th this is where I go to. Is it homaging? Is it just great to watch our characters do the thing, or am I just hearing the same joke that I've heard a bunch before? And and that and that one kind of I kind of went, yeah, that's that's the Spock joke, you know, that I've heard before. And um, if it's all the above, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and the one thing we find out during this briefing room scene is because one of those two robot grain ships was damaged. They have beamed all the Quintetelli over onto the Enterprise, including a whole bunch of big cargo bins just lining all the corridors. And I'm sure we'll not, we won't have any problem with any of that at all. Yeah, right. No problem. <laughs> but we've got tribbles on the ship, Quinto Triticali in the corridors, Klingons in the quadrant. It can ruin your whole day, sir. <laughs> Again, that line is so funny, and I hear that repeated out of context uh, from my my kindergartner all the time. It can ruin your whole day. You know, it's That's so hilarious. it's so funny because it, I, I, the exasperation that the original series characters feel for things, um, you know, Scotty Bones, you know, Kirk, they're, they're just they're, how how upset they get about all these uh, inconveniences. I think really, as a child, it spoke to me both in the original series and the animated series. But now that I see the effect it has on a kid, it's great. It's it's great how upset and worried that Scotty gets. And it's funny. It, and it propels why we watch it. I don't know. It's just something that I feel like people don't talk about enough about what? how they blow their tops all the time, you know? And, of course, right then, it's when we pick up, uh, sensors are picking up the Klingon battle cruisers so it looks like we're going back into battle and the first thought we have is oh wow it seems like they can recharge their weapon really fast but the klingon ship isn't coming after the enterprise it's going after one of the grain ships and they didn't destroy it they just shot the propulsion unit captain koloff is quite a marksman and we ready our phasers and the, they fire on each other and when they fire a bunch of those grain bins in the corridors spill open <laughs> and you know where that's going to take us. Absolutely. We cut to Tribbles. They're on the grain, and they get instantly bigger and bigger and bigger. One of the interesting shots, by the way, which is a cool idea, but I don't think works really well because the animation is just so cheap, is there's a shot where we fire a photon torpedo, and we follow the photon torpedo as it flies to the ship. Totally something we couldn't do in the original series. Absolutely. Except the photon torpedo is like just a blob of orange ink. It's like really... Not a, not, not a cool drawing, but a cool idea. Yeah. The robot ship is disabled, so now we put a tractor beam on the robot ship, and we hear... That could be exactly what they want us to do. Tow the robot and limit our available power. We're carrying the extra mass of the first ship's cargo, and now we have the second one in tow. That requires a great deal of power we won't be able to use in battle. And all while this is happening... Whenever Captain Kirk goes back to his chair, there's a tribble on his chair. At first, it's, it's, it's bigger than usual, and he actually says, how fat do these things get? And then he moves back to the chair again, and the tribble is bigger, and you see him struggle a little more to push it off. And then there's a third time he goes back to the chair, and it's even bigger, struggles to push it off. Of course, this is the running joke from the trouble with tribbles when right. he sat in the chair and he sat on what was then a very small triple. So I think this is a, a great way to sort of keep that joke going. Only the triple keeps getting so big that at one point Kirk just can't even like move it. Well, Mr. Spock, do you have any ideas? We could always throw triples at them. I thought Vulcans didn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and Spock says, and I think this moment is cool. He says, we don't captain. 
And Mr. Spock, in a classic Spock way, raises one eyebrow. And we cut back to Kirk, and now animated Kirk raises an eyebrow back, which is something I don't think we ever saw in the original series. Uh, again, <laughs> can you imagine that volley in a live action? You know, yeah. that that Spock raises his eyebrow, and then Kirk raises his. I think that would have been great. I love this shot, by the way, of the Predator going to eat the now much, much bigger Tribbles. I think we start to realize what the problem is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Kirk hears about the cargo containers and the Tribbles are eating them. We call Cyrano Jones up to the bridge. And I love that he comes up trying to make a sale. Captain Kirk, what can I do for you? Some uh, spick and flame gems, uh, <laughs> perhaps? But he says spick and Flame gems. Chicken flame gems. Now in Trouble with Tribbles, when he's at the bar, they're talking about spicing I, flame I know. gems. <laughs> oh. You know, it's it's forgivable that that Stanley Adams would not remember the pronunciation of spicing yeah. flame gems. It's them. not as egregious as everyone saying Orion in the Pirates of Orion. You right, know, there, you the <laughs> there you go. There you go. Your tribbles are all over my ship. My security men can't find them all. You need better security men, Captain. And I was like, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> the women, the security women are yeah. better than the security men because look what they just did in the, the Lorelei signal. In the Lorelei signal, yeah. Captain, a harmless little tribble. What can they hurt? And that's when we see an even bigger tribble in Kirk's chair. <laughs> and they ask him, Jones, is this the ecological sabotage the Klingons are so mad about? And again, we don't get the answer. Because the Klingons are coming back. Deflector shields up. Stand by photon torpedoes. And all non-combatants off the bridge. I actually had to explain to my daughter what a combatant meant. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, this is why Star Trek is educational. Uh, it, the vocabulary in Star Trek is fantastic for children. I've often thought this. Um, even as a child watching The Next Generation, I, I was aware that I would be knowing more words than some of my peers uh, so, no, I, I love I think that people said this about the animated series at the time, though, is that its dialogue wasn't sort of dumbed down. Right. right? right like right. So, like the violence was toned down and the sex was toned down from the original series. But the dialogue is not like the dialogue itself is identical. And that's what makes it so wonderful is that, like, David Gerald knew what would be funny and that kids would think it would be funny that the grain was back and that it was all you know similar, but that it's not. um. Yeah, it's not somehow – you can imagine it being so much worse, I guess, yeah, in that yeah, era. Good point. Good point. So we come back in Act 3, and we're firing photon torpedoes, and we get a little bit of space battle. Message coming in, sir. Ah, Captain Kirk. We'll take control of your ship now. Not if I can help it. And they argue over Cyrano Jones. And Kirk says, Close channel, Lieutenant. With pleasure, sir. That's – where Spock looks over at Kirk and says, Aren't you going to sit down, sir? And Kirk is standing right next to the captain's chair with a giant pink tribble in the middle, and he says, I think I'll stand. Which is my favorite line. And again, like Shatner just totally nailing the comedy. <laughs> On the Klingon ship, we are giving an order. Implement boarding plan C. And while the Klingons have boarding plan C, the Enterprise has emergency plan B. Mm -hmm. Mr. Spock suggested it. <laughs> yes. And we see the Klingons all lined up. I'm assuming to go transport over to the Enterprise, ready to go to battle. They open up this huge door and behind the huge door are even huger tribbles. A small thing here is I really love that they it's the Klingon uh, insignia that is the canonical Klingon insignia that we mm. then see. And I feel like that was a little inconsistent in the original series, but it's like definitely there. Um, on their doors and on their ships. And I just, I always loved that in that particular scene. The cutesy music as the giant Tribble walks through the, I don't know. I don't, I don't love it, but I, I am sure many, many people do. Captain Koloff, are you ready to release my ship? Release your ship? Kirk, you are monotonous. You don't know yet, do you? <laughs> and I like the moment where Koloth is like, Our instruments report nothing except some undue transporter activity. And, and that's when we see the giant tribbles in the background. And there's this goofy music, which yeah. is not, doesn't have the same impact as the uh, score from The Trouble with Tribbles, but they're, they're, you know, 
They tried. <laughs> and then as we finally find out what the sabotage was, which is that... Cyrano Jones took a Klingon genetic construct, an artificial creature, from one of our planets. The glomer, the triple predator, is what Cyrano Jones stole. And that's all you want? Jones is not that important. We must have the glomer. And it's like, I wish, why didn't you just say this from the beginning? <laughs> like, we could have solved this whole problem. You can't do this to me. Under space salvage laws, he's mine. A planetary surface is not covered by space salvage laws. But if you want the little beastie that bad, Mr. Jones, we'll transport you over with it. I withdraw my claim. <laughs> I withdraw my claim. Yep. <laughs> they beam the glomer over, and we hear... Well, at least we can report the stasis field is not as effective a weapon as we thought. I don't know. It seemed like a pretty effective weapon to me. No, so I don't know if you gentlemen are, are familiar with this theory is that some people think that, and I believe this because Brian Fuller was still in charge of some of those early Star Trek Discovery episodes, is that the weapon that the Klingons have in Star Trek Discovery that has a very similar impact to Starfleet ships is a prototype in 2256 of the one that the Klingons are then using in whatever this is, would be like 2269, 2270. Um, and that that is a connection. And hmm. the Klingons, you know, we know the Klingons are always trying to increase their tech, get cloaking, you know, getting cloak tech from the Romulans or whatever. But I kind of like that, that I think that that works. Sure um, it does. Like pretty well. Absolutely um, and, it and does. considering that the triples are, all, there's also, you know, Lorca has a triple that doesn't reproduce in Discovery, and maybe that is something that the Klingon, you know. Anyway, uh, just a little little side note there. There's something that I... That's I, what that, the show uh, is all about, by the way, Ryan. Yeah. That's what we do here on Enterprise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then what we hear from McCoy, which I didn't, even watching it, I was like, wait, what did he just say? And it took me a while to understand what he was saying. He says... He's talking about how Jones genetically engineered the Tribbles and that it was slipshod. And he says, You see, they're not just giant Tribbles, they're colonies. And I was like, well, I don't understand what the heck you're talking about. And we go back to the Klingons. He did it to us again. The tin-plated, overbearing excuse for a starship captain did it to us again. Which is kind of pulling some lines from the great scene in the yeah, bar. Tim-plated, overbearing dictator with delusions of godhood. Yeah. <laughs> and they shoot the triple, and it, instead of disappearing, it turns into just a whole bunch of little triples. And this is where I went, oh, oh. that's what McCoy was saying about it being a colony. Any other orders, sir? Yes. Don't do that again. Ever. Ever. <laughs> and McCoy, it says, like, a simple shot is going to fix everything. The triple colonies will break down into their individual units with a slower metabolic rate. And these really will be safe triples now. But then Kirk notices in the Jeffrey's tube, there's yep. still a big triple up there. You didn't get this one, Bones. Yeah, yeah. Kirk says, hey, you forgot one. And then uh, the tube, the triple bursts, it turns into a bunch of little triples burying Kirk once again, just like at the end of Act 3 in The Trouble with Tribbles. And Kirk digs himself out of it and says, Someday I'll learn. Aye, Captain. But you've got to admit, if we've got to have Tribbles, it's best if all our Tribbles are little ones. And that is the end of More Tribbles, More Troubles. I, I think this is a ton of fun. And after, I, you know, these first few episodes, so, so More Tribbles, More Troubles is the fifth in as many episodes to be written by a veteran from the original series. So, you know, whenever the animated series sort of gets a bad rap or people don't take it seriously or give it the respect it deserves, it is deserving as, uh, as just as much respect as the original series or the next generation or any other Star Trek series we've had over the last now almost 57 years. And just the, the, the strength that, that yeah, it was shorter, much shorter, and animated. And yeah, the animated might have been a little archaic and that the, the music might have been overused to an extent, but you've got the writing. It's, it was always about the writing. If the writing and the performances are what saved the original series, and that is why that show held up after all these years, because the writing was so good, the writing in the animated series is also very, very, very good. Brian, what's your take on that? Well, I think that Star Trek is funny, and I think that this is something that, um, you know, because we take Star Trek so seriously and because we talk about its uh, political 
and sociological uh, uh, sort of um, messages and how progressive and ahead of it, ahead of its time it was for representation in the 60s and even in the 90s in other ways uh, with Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, we sometimes forget that with all the importance of Star Trek is that it's really fun and it's really funny. And the reason why it connects um, with uh, people when they're very young including myself when I was very young, is because of that. And the original series has a lot. Uh, you were saying earlier, Scott, like if uh, the season three showrunner didn't recognize the humor in Star Trek, you don't get Star Trek then. Star Trek is at its best when there's a combination of like a really great sort of original adventure with some wit, with some genuine wit. And those asides um, uh, in this episode with Spock and Sereno Jones, um, um, I believe I just said that, you know, is just what the show is. That is that it has to be fun in order for the adventure to be intellectually provocative. You know, so it might not be the deepest concept. The Tribbles are not, you know, um, but it's in Nichelle Nichols' uh, uh, memoir that she's like, well, even in our funniest episode, we were still talking about animals being mistreated. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that that is important, but it's also like, I don't know, just Star Trek doesn't work unless it's hilarious. Um, on some level. Um, it can't all be earnest. It can't all be the undiscovered country, which of course has hilarious lines in it as well. Sure. Yeah, it's a good point. And listen, I, I just think that, that, you know, we talked about this before uh, many times during our run through the original series that I felt like as great as the first season was, and as much as I enjoy sort of watching them find their way in terms of pacing and lighting, and uh, certainly the way Leonard Nimoy was took him a few episodes to figure out really how to play Spock. I think Star Trek really hit its stride in season two because you just had these, these directors, they were revolving, Joseph Pevney, Mark Daniels, Ralph Sinensky, you know, Vincent McAvity. And you had, you know, at least for the first half of season two, Gene Coombe running the show. Dorothy Fontana was still there. Rod Burry was still involved in everything. Bob Justman was still there. And that you could have really high stakes, dramatic adventures like the Doomsday Machine and Mirror Mirror, and then have the Trouble with Tribbles, I Mud, and Piece of the Action. I mean, season two is, I think, next to season three of Next Generation, season three of Next Gen, season two of the original Star Trek is the best season Star Trek ever had. So I'm trying to think of how to say this in a delicate way. Go ahead. Um, the, <laughs> be delicate. We can handle it. So <laughs> while I have been continually impressed, as I said, at how much this really is Star Trek and feels like Star Trek, I don't agree, Scott, with the statement that this should be given as much respect as the original series or any other series of Star Trek because it's not as good. And it's clearly not as good. Like there is no, even though it's, and this is the way I finally figured out how to articulate it, I think. Okay. So, you know, they talked about Babe Ruth, one of the great, you know, hitters of all time, also having more strikeouts than anybody else. But he hit those home runs. Is that the original series, I won't even say it's Babe Ruth because their batting average is way better than Babe Ruth's batting <laughs> average, but it absolutely strikes out. It totally strikes out, particularly in the second half of season three, a whole bunch. But there is nothing like the home runs the original series hits in the animated series, not even close. And it's like, this is like a really good double A player. They don't play in the big show. Like, like for the league that they're in, are they hitting a bunch of, you know, nice, decent ba base hits and they know how to play the game well? Absolutely. Is there ever going to be anything in the animated series that lives up to the greatest episodes of the original series? No effing way. It's mm -hmm. not even close, Other in my maybe opinion. Maybe yesteryear. Maybe no, yesteryear. I don't think so. I like yesteryear. But yesteryear does not match up to a mock time. There's no, I mean, like, there just isn't, it's not that. It is really good Star Trek. This is just for me. But I, I'm going to tell you, the odds are, once we get through the animated series, maybe there are two episodes I'm ever going to watch again in my entire life. All That's right. my feeling about it. This is what I have to say about that. Steve, I agree with you, okay? I agree with you. But I'm thinking also of a comment that I read recently on our Facebook page when someone called me to task for saying what I just said before, your comment about the original series and the animated series being equals. And this person said, I wish I had written the name down, 
he said, you know what, Scott, I think you're grading the animated series on a curve. Yes. I and think, he, yeah. I, and, yeah. And I'm going to say this. Yeah, I am grading the animated series on a curve. Just like I was kind of grading season three of the original series on a curve. Because yeah, there's definitely episodes of the third season of TOS that I don't really like, but there are there are a lot that I do. And there are a couple that I like more than I thought I did or that I remembered that I did. Or by going back with a, with a perspective and looking at it with a different set of eyes after doing this podcast that I think are even better than I remember. Um, but also when it comes to the animated series, I mean, look, you're talking about an animated show. You're talking about animation that wasn't always up to, up to par. You're talking about the length being less than half of the original show. And you're also talking about music that got reused over and over to the point where it got kind of just uh, nauseating. But at the same time, the reason I gave it, I grade the animated series on a curve, and I'm happy to do so, is because I'm looking for the good in the animated series, and there's a whole lot of good there. There's even a there's even a lot of great there. Is it going to live up to City and A Mock Time and Doomsday Machine and Mirror Mirror? And no, of course not. Um, but I think so far, and we're only five episodes into the animated series now, and I've really, really enjoyed. Every everyone we've done so far, including more triples, more troubles. And yes, I am grading it on a curve because I'm saying, you know what? For the quality that we were given on the animated series, there's so much about it that raises it to the level uh, or close to the level of the original show that I go, you know what? This show deserves credit for for being as good as it actually is because Roddenberry and Fontana were told uh, told their writers. Write like Star Trek. Don't right. write a kitty Star Trek. Write a Star Trek episode. And they did. And with all the constraints and with all the limitations that they had, they still delivered a top quality product that for, for what it is, is a lot better than what people give it credit for. So I agree with you, Steve, but at the same time, I am grading it on a curve. And by grading it on a curve, I'm liking it and loving it more than I ever thought I could. Ryan, I, what is your take on that? Well, I'm going to be brief, but I agree with both of you. Um, I think that you just have to consider the audience. You know what I mean? And I think that, you know, if, as a filmation show, you know what I mean? This is the studio that gave us He-Man. Um, you know what I mean? Um, you <laughs> know, the Brady Kids. Mike, which J. Michael Straczynski wrote on, and he's a genius. And, you know, and, you know, um, but I mean, I think that, um, look, I love, I use a similar uh, uh, home run analogy about the animated series in my book. There aren't any in the animated series, yeah. right? But if Star Trek is largely uh, art that is for adults, that occasionally doesn't exclude children, right? Like the next generation often includes children, sometimes is a family show. The original series sometimes is. The rest of it is kind of a wash. Um, it's adult art, right, for the most part. This is the exception uh, in terms of things that were made in the 20th century that was not exclusively marketed at, at adults. Uh, that's the great success of the original series, right? It was the first adult science fiction show that had continuing characters ever. There were no other adult science fiction shows. You know, Doctor Who was a, technically a children's show, right? Like a live action adult show with continuing characters, Star Trek was the first. So then it becomes a kid's show, a Saturday morning cartoon. Well, okay, if you look at it that way, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't exist at all. Because it doesn't have any home runs, but it gets on base every time, and it encourages, to extend the baseball metaphor, children to enjoy the game, right? That they will enjoy this. They'll say, this is, this is a safe place for you to have imaginative thoughts and to have adventures that are, that are, that are open-minded and that problems don't have to be solved with violence and that there's creativity and tactics and compassion. So to me... The, the animated series is like Yellow Submarine. I don't like Yellow Submarine, the song. I love the Beatles. But Yellow Submarine gets my daughter into the Beatles. And then she can listen to Helter Skelter when she's old enough. And so that's what the animated series is. And it's like a Beatles album with just all Ringo songs. And that's okay. <laughs> because then you get, you get a sense of why the Beatles are great. Because you know what? Ringo's great too. 
And it's okay that the animated series is mostly Ringo song. I, I, and that's I, how I feel about it. I, I just got to say, Ryan, you're speaking my language because if there's one one thing I love as much as Star Trek, it's the Beatles. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, those are my two obsessions, Star Trek and the Beatles. And you I'm, friends with Morgan Gundell, who wrote The Inner Light? Oh, yes. Yes. He, he and I text about the Beatles constantly. Oh, I did not know he was a Beatles fan. Okay. The Inner Light is named after a George Harrison Well, of song. course it is. It's the B-side. That's one of the reasons that I'm friends with Morgan is I, I said this to him at a convention 12 years ago and we became friends instantly. It's, yeah, the, we B-side, it's the B-side to Lady Madonna. It's a wonderful so, song. But yeah, he wanted to call Starship Mine Revolution, but they wouldn't let him. That's what he claims. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, as far as like, if you're going to look at, if you're going to look at the original series as basically Revolver through Abbey Road, <laughs> um, or even start uh, Rubber Soul through Abbey Road, um, then I would look at the animated series as A Hard, Day's, a hard Day's Night, <laughs> A Hard Day's Night in Help. That's yeah, I mean, I would almost look at the animated series as like Wings, you know, where it's not that great, but at least you got Paul, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> okay. So, so n- not to go off on the Beatles tangent too much more, although I love the Beatles too. Um, I think this is actually a great conversation to have. And I'm really happy, Scott, that you grade on a curve. Because I think, and I think what's interesting about this conversation is that it relates to how you love the thing that you love. And when we started way back when we gave our mission statement, I had said, and you, I think, felt the same way, that my love for the original series is unconditional. Mm-hmm. Which, And what I mean by that is that even the lesser episodes, I still love because it's unconditional love. That does not represent how I look at art in general. It is a very specific <laughs> thing to the original series. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and, I, and I want to tell a really brief story. Um, when I was in film school, I did a bunch of sitcoms in film school at USC. And one of my sitcom teachers, I was so lucky to have this guy, which is one of my, the writing teacher was a guy named Sam Denoff. And Sam Denoff wrote for the Dick Van Dyke show, created That Girl, and was one of the great comedy, he and his partner, Bill Persky, was the great classic American sitcom writers of all time. Mm. So, sit, you know, like being able to listen to this guy tell stories was one of the great things ever. And we're making, I think it was the second sitcom I made that I, I, I wrote, and I'm working with him on it. And it was basically a thing where, we were a student film production of a sitcom and there was just something we couldn't do. And I went, well, it's just, we can't afford to do that thing. And so it's just, people just have to accept that it's not going to be as good because we can't afford to do that thing. And Sam said, well, if you'd like to go door to door and knock on everyone watching your show and telling them why it shouldn't, why they should get, give it a slightly better grade than they normally would, you could try to go do that. But people judge your show for what it is. And I was like, He's to- you are totally right. And yeah. what we figured out was a way to do the thing that we wanted to do for very little money and not have a lesser than moment. And that's something that has stuck with me my whole life. Everything wow. you said about the animated show is totally true. And they did do a great thing for the amount of money they had and the circumstances they had, but I don't grade on a curve, you know, like maybe the original series I do, but for this, I don't. And so, but that does, but this is also like, that's why I say it's a great way to have the conversation. How do you love the things you love? You know, some people, lo- if it's just a little piece of Star Trek trivia or memorabilia or something that's not, a, but they love it. And that's awesome. It isn't how I love things. You know what I mean? But, it, right. but, but that's part of this community that we're a part of that approaches it in different ways. Well, okay. You know, uh, listen, this is the, I think the best part of this whole conversation. Um, the, the grading on a curve thing. Like when we got to the third season, Steve, and we got to the empath uh, and the cloud minders, I kind of graded those on a curve because there were things I really, really, really liked about them. And obviously, as you remember, when we were talking about the empath. I mean, that was a, an episode that that moved me in a way that I that I it really, really got to me just during the yeah. conversation. But you know, as as we record this conversation. I've been going back to the beginning of the next generation, rewatching the next generation. So I always sort of, you know, when I remember watching Next Gen in 88, 89, 87, I remember, God, you know, the first two seasons of Next Generation just weren't very good, except for a couple episodes here and there, like Q Who and The Measure of a Man. But when I went back to rewatch, I was surprised by how many good episodes actually exist in seasons one and two. And like I was watching Home Soil, like that's a really good episode. 
But then, then what happened was as I crossed over into season three and I got to episodes like The Survivors and Who Watches the Watchers, um, then I went, okay, yeah, season three of Next Generation is where it's at. It's, it's the gold standard of Next Generation. It's as good as that show ever got. There was so much more depth and gravitas uh, to season three. And, and I think Patrick Stewart's performance alone uh, to, went to another level. Um, but I still loved the episodes of Next Generation that I rewatched from seasons one and two. So I think it's about grading on a curve. I think it's perspective. Like I said, with the animated show, I hadn't watched these episodes, none of them, in decades. And now we're doing these conversations where, Steve, like you, I was like, man, is this, is this going to hold up? But the kind of scrutiny we gave to the original show. And I would say that so far, five episodes into the animated series, it kind of does. And I think because it kind of does, uh, that makes it really worthy of, of being part of the conversation as much as any other Star Trek show. You, you know, I, I, it is funny, too, because what I, I want to amend what I said a little bit, because I, I, I think I more that I grade on. Two, I've, I give two grades <laughs> because when my son comes home and he loves to draw and shows me a drawing and his drawing has improved so much. And I'm like, but this is really good. Now, is it really a good drawing without any curve at all? No, <laughs> it's not a, he is not a professional, <laughs> but for a kid who's 11 and a half, it's really pretty good. And so I can look at an animated episode and go for what this is, or like Lorelai signal, which is so important in all these ways. Cause a horror gets to command. Do I think it's really a great episode of star Trek? No, I don't. Do I think for what it is, it's really good. Yes, I do. You know? And so I can put, have both of those thoughts in my head at the same time. Sure. And, and, and I think that's a good way to approach stuff in general is like, okay, what is this trying to be for what it is? What is it? But also have an objective part of your brain that go, okay, in the grand scheme of art, where is this? And it's like, okay, it's here. You know? <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say, uh, you know, with regards to the Laurel Eye Signal, yes, it is a landmark episode because Uhura got to take command. That was a very, very big deal. She leads a contention of all female security guards. I mean, it's an empowering, like fist pumping, like, oh my God, yeah, go Uhura moment. Um, but sure, there are other aspects of the Laurel Eye Signal that I, I don't think are very good. I mean, look at Plato's stepchildren. An episode that has, have to? Uh, well, for for this conversation, no. yes, you know what and I mean. I know where you're. I know where you're going to go. Go, yeah. Go okay, ahead. I mean, not not just because of the kiss, because of the significance of the kiss, but because of the moments between Kirk and Alexander. Yeah. Uh, you know, when Kirk says to him, "Where I come from, nobody has the power, uh, race, color, none of that matters." Um, you know, there are a lot of great moments in in Plato's stepchildren, but then again. There's a lot about it, especially that the you know when when Kirk and Spock are tortured, um, that I really don't like. Uh, so it's like a mixed bag. But I look at the positive, grading it on a curve. Ryan, what do you got? I feel like that as a parent who has what um, Steve just described as sort of like an unconditional love of Star Trek in general, like of the idea of Star Trek in general. Um, I grade on a curve real hard with Star Trek, and also. In my profession, I find that with science fiction that even tries, I grade on a curve. I mean, I just finished writing this book about Dune, right? And like I was only became a Dune fan when I was like in my 20s. So it has a different place for me than Star Trek, which I was a fan from when I was six. You know what I mean? And so that's very different, you know? And so then I, I but I found myself, you know, when you're a critic and a journalist, you, you always want to find the thing that's interesting to talk about rather than to just say, this is bad, right? Or this is good. You want to find right. the thing that's interesting to talk about. You want to try to find the tension between those things. Star Trek has a lot of that. So that's why it's so great to like do podcasts about it and write about it and, you know, interview people about it and dissect it because there's so much tension between that. You don't even have to say if it's good or bad. You could just talk about the significance of Uhura taking command and you could talk about that for, you know, three hours, you know, and it, and it actually is really fulfilling to, to discuss those things. So I think that with Star Trek, it's almost never about the quality to me, because in a way, it's for the most part, there are exceptions to this. And there are things that I reject, you know, and the things I don't like of uh, various iterations and specific episodes. But overall, the intelligence and the intelligence that it that it assumes of the viewer in most iterations of Star Trek is so much higher 
than most things. Right. Doctor Who is close. You know what I mean? In terms of its its assumption that the audience can follow it. There's a colony uh, villain in, in in Doctor Who, by the way, and uh, it's full made of snakes uh, from the Peter Capaldi era. Um, we were talking about colony creatures in the triple episode. But what I like as a parent and as somebody who is interested in fiction that has a positive impact, the way that Star Trek had a positive impact on me, not just in all the obvious ways, but just in the thinking critically ways, is that it doesn't matter. Again, it just doesn't matter sometimes if a Star Trek episode fails. We watched, uh, you're talking about TNG season two. Yep. I watched Pen Pals with my daughter recently. Okay. okay? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, th- this is a flawed episode. <laughs> this yeah. is a deeply flawed episode. Yes. And my memory, I thought it was more about Data communicating with Serjanka than it was about Wesley. But then I watched it with my kid and she was really invested in Wesley standing up to these people in the science lab. And I was like, well, maybe they knew what they were doing. You know, maybe this maybe this episode, as flawed as it is for me as a piece of adult art, perhaps I forgot how good this was when I was, I mean, I was nine when that episode came out. You know, so maybe I forgot how good this was because now I view Star Trek as this thing that has to tick off these artistic boxes for me. And maybe that's not what it's supposed to be. You know, maybe it's supposed to be more like The Hobbit or something like that, where it's a little bit unwieldy and it's supposed to communicate things in sort of an awkward uh, way. And I think that might be okay. So, but that said, is that the animated series, I wish the animated series was better. But more than that, I just wish there was more of it. Yeah. Because I think if there had been more of it, we would be having a different discussion. Like, imagine the animated series has been on for five years. Well, then suddenly we could, we could, it, it would be a, it wouldn't be as much of a curiosity. It would feel more like a phenomenon. So that's my only real problem with the animated series is there's not enough of it to discuss in order to like make this grading on a curve thing. It's, it's almost unfair to it, you know? I, but, but you know what, Ryan? I think the fact that there are 22 episodes, I think that leads means there is enough to discuss because that means it's almost as long as a season of the original series. The shortest season of the of TOS was season three, had 24 episodes. And then you have 22 episodes of, of basically season four, the animated series. I think, you know, I think it's worthy of sort of like uh, – sort of extending the umbrella, you know, like making it go a little further to cover the animated show uh, and and it all be the original series. And as far as this episode, uh, David Gerald said, I looked at the episode again with the Blu-rays came out and I thought this is better than I remember. I tend to be a, a tough critic on my own work, but I looked at it again and said, actually, this has some good stuff in it and it works. I felt good about that. Dorothy Fontana said, and I love Dorothy Fontana, more Tribbles, More Troubles is another episode I love from the animated series. David Gerald brought his trademark skills and humor and action to the script, and it was a worthy sequel to The Trouble with Tribbles. With the use of animation, we could stuff the Enterprise from the top of the saucer to the shuttle bay with Tribbles, all of them pink. Here's what just occurred to me about all of this. There is a distinction, I think, between stuff you like and art that's great. And I would say for me, there's all sorts of stuff that I like, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make it great. And what makes a thing great, and this was the motivation for doing my other podcast, The Cinephiles, and of course, the reason I really wanted to do the original series with you, Scott, is that the stuff that's great, like you saw Mirror, 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 Mirror when you were six, right? Six that's or seven? Right. Mm-hmm. Six. And, and you loved it then. And every time you watched it after... I bet you saw new things up until we did it for the show where that it's that you, when you first loved it, didn't even understand its greatness. You didn't even understand how much it could be. Right. And that's the thing that I'm excited. That's what greatness is, is where you keep going back and keep going back and keep discovering. That's, that's the thing that I was. And, and look, the, the, the entire, the, the original show, you know, we went back and we, we really went back on it and we discovered new things about it every single week by looking at it with this, with this fresh new perspective. But what a conversation, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us on enterprise incidents. Again, Ryan's book phasers on stun, how the making and remaking of star Trek changed the world is available. Now, wherever you buy books, go on Barnes and Noble, go on Amazon, go wherever you can. If you do not have this book, it is a really, really good read. It's a fun read. It's all right there. And whether you 
are a casual Star Trek fan or even a diehard, the freshness and the fun of Phasers on Stun will make it a page turner. I strongly encourage you to put Phasers on Stun on your ever-growing Star Trek bookshelf. But in the meantime, Ryan, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, uh, just Ryan C. Britt um, on Twitter. And I'm also on Instagram at uh, Ryan.Britt. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm writing about Picard a lot right now. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. I've got a, I've got some uh, big stuff coming out in the next couple of weeks for that. So Sounds good. And of course, we'd love to hear what you think about more Tribbles, more Troubles. And even more so, I would love to hear where you weigh in on what I thought was a really interesting discussion on the animated series and art in general. We'd love to hear that. You could visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for Enterprise Incidents. You can also follow us on Twitter at Enter Incidents, Enterprise Incidents on Instagram. And you could subscribe to the show on every podcast subscription place, including Overcast, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher. But if you happen to go on Apple Podcasts, please leave your reviews there. They help a lot. And if you want to support the show, you could do it through Anchor and you just go right to the show notes. Right at the top, there's a link and you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month, as much as $9.99 a month. And if you want to follow me, it's at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And on my, I was trying to think of cute furry things on my other podcast, The Cinephiles, and we've covered both the original Muppet movie and Ratatouille, if you want to check out those deep dives. <laughs> Scott, how would people find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Man. So be sure to support us uh, making a generous donation through Anchor. Uh, little as 99 cents, as much as 9.99 a month. We love doing Enterprise Incidents, but it is work. It's a labor of love, and we love that you've been listening and supporting. Make sure you share Enterprise Incidents on all of your social media platforms to get the word out for people who may not have yet have discovered Enterprise Incidents because we are always happy and thrilled to welcome new listeners aboard. Speaking of the next adventure, please be sure to join us next time on Enterprise Incidents for The Survivor. The Survivor is next. Until then, keep going boldly. (laughs) 